Got a couple weeks left. Only a few more of these, and we're live. You should sound sadder. There's only a couple of weeks left. Only a few more of these. We're nearly at the end of our journey. That's, that, that to me is what it, anyways. Um, gives you an idea of some of the multiple choice stuff. So what will you have on the day of the test? Your test is in a week. You will have, listen closely, Brendan, you will have your colored bio map. You need to have that done by the Wednesday. I'm not giving you marks for that one. I'm saying, look, if you want to be able to identify biomes, I'm not going to give you a map on the test. You want to bring that. So a few of you have handed it in and I've said, oh, that's wonderful. I didn't actually give you, if you look on the email, the biomes map does not show up as an assignment. You also need to know what the major characteristics of each biome is. The easiest way to do that, by the way, was to complete that big uh, biome summary assignment that I gave you where you looked at, I think, 10 pages worth in the textbook and you wrote down the climate, the adaptations, and some of that stuff. You need to know that. So let's walk through this. It says, circle the letter of the best answer. What are the major biomes found in Canada? To me, hey, look at the biomes map. This is not something to memorize. If you don't have a biomes map, why don't you, Miller, my friend, why don't, if you have your textbook in front of you, open it to page 10, or have your colored biome map in front of you. What do we have in Canada? A, lots of tundra, some boreal forest, and then we do have us. Our climate doesn't fit into those. We have that temperate rainforest. It's called the West Coast Mediterranean climate is what it was called when I was growing up, but they've changed the name. But most of Canada, forest and cold. Number two, what two factors are most responsible for limiting life? Now, we talked about biotic and abiotic factors. Biotic, it's living. Think biology. Abiotic, the prefix a means not living. Think like anti or opposite of. Can you just hand it in on the appropriate block? Thanks, kiddo. Um, what are the two big ones? What are the two big ones? The two big factors? Okay, the two big ones are precipitation and temperature. Because temperature, that's actually controlled by sunlight and elevation and climate. That, uh, that swallows up a whole bunch of different subcategories. Precipitation, that's both rain and climate. Okay. You're going to need to read one of these charts. In fact, you're going to probably get this exact same chart on your test. Number three says, uh, what biome has an average annual temperature of 15 degrees? If you can write on the quiz or on the test, and you will be able to, the easiest way to get this is to go temperature 15, which is right there, precipitation 40, which is right there, and literally draw a line, or for those of you in math 10, draw a system of equations and find where they cross. Uh, that looks like grassland. I had to figure out the legend. A. So you have a couple of questions like that on your test. Turn the page, or next page over. Number 14, where is the boreal forest biome found? Again, this is from the map on page 10, or your biome coloring map. Uh, where is most boreal forest found? Brendan, yeah, in the northern hemispheres. Not much forest, not much boreal forest in the southern hemispheres. And in the equator, it's not boreal, it's mostly tropical rainforest. Uh, what characteristics are tropical forests known for? Anytime they give me, and the provincial exam loves questions like this, where they give you three or four categories to choose from, and then they have A, you know, some of the above, B, none of the above. What I do, Hayden, is I go through each category and I put a check mark or an X. In other words, I would look at uh, high diversity. I looked up tropical rainforests and it did say next to them that there's a high diversity. I would say that's correct. Abundance of large mammals. Actually, tropical rainforests don't have an abundance of large mammals. We have bear and caribou and large mammals up north. They don't have them. Uh, high year-round temperatures, that is true. So by doing that, I'm less likely to accidentally circle the wrong answer down below, Brad, because what drives me crazy is when I know the correct answer and I circle the wrong one, that, that to me is a dumb mistake. I want to try and beat that out of my system. Uh, hey, what's the correct answer? Looks like D. Number six. Which of the following best describes the distribution of communities on a tall mountain? 
tall mountain, I think what they mean is snow-capped mountain, not like, you know, little Sumas Mountain or something like that nearby here. Uh, coniferous forests grow above the tree. The tree line is the line where no trees grow above. A is wrong because coniferous forests don't grow above the tree line. Nothing grows above, no trees grow above the tree line. Several biome conditions might be present depending on elevation. I kind of like that. And there may be permanent ice conditions on top of the mountain. I think I'm okay with that one. I'm leaning towards B. Let me read the rest. With increasing elevation, tall trees are replaced by shorter trees and ultimately, finally, are replaced by grasses. At the top of mountains that are tall, is there grass? What's at the top of mountains that are tall? That last sentence. I wasn't sure about the first two phrases. I was okay with that, Hayden. But that last one, they said ultimately replaced by grass. No, ultimately replaced by uh, frost, ice, and snow. Uh, D, tundra-like conditions exist at the top of the highest mountains. Sure. Deserts are found at the lower elevations. No. I see mountains behind us that have snow at the top, but I don't think they're deserts. B. Number seven, what's the correct order of biomes that you would observe if you traveled from the equator? Well, I know the northernmost biome is tundra, so I went, can't be that, can't be that. Oh, and I know the one at the equator is tropical rainforest, so I said it can't be that one, and it can't be that one. Oh, and I've already crossed out that one. It's B or C. Then I carefully read, I said, I think it goes tropical, temperate, boreal, tundra. It's C. And again, that's right from the map on page 10. Which of the following would be a biotic factor in a vegetable garden? Biotic, does that mean living or non-living? Living. So I'm just going to look at these and say, which one's got living stuff? Nitrogen, that's a chemical. That's not living. Rainfall, that's water. That's not living. The number of earthworms. Earthworms are living. Maybe that one. Oxygen in the soil, that's a chemical. Those other three that I've crossed out are abiotic factors, but biotic factors, C. Turn the page. In which relationship does neither party benefit? This one, I actually circled the wrong answer and then came back and caught myself. Well, I said, in mutualism, they both benefit. And in predation, one benefits, the prey, sorry, the predator, food. Uh, parasitism, one benefits, and the other one is harmed. So I said it's, it's between those two, um, but it's A, in competition, because, Laura, let's suppose you and I are animals. Now, we don't eat each other. We're both, let's say, uh, small rodent mammals. Let's say squirrels, you're one type of squirrel, I'm one type of squirrel. We're not going to eat each other, but we're both after the same food source. We're in competition with each other. None of us benefit. If you were studying the niche, remember we said that the niche, we're going to hit pause. Remember we said the niche or the niche, depending on what part of the country or what part of the continent you're from, um, that's the particular area, the particular small section of a community, of a habitat, of an ecosystem that a species inhabits. Uh, let's see, what might you study? I think you would study the food that it eats because if there isn't enough food, it's not going to live there. I think you would study its predators because it's part of the predator-prey cycle. I think you would study the temperature required for it to reproduce. There's a reason that parrots don't live in the boreal forest. Uh, you would study the type of areas where it builds its nest. You would study all of these, because those are all functions of its niche. Vocabulary, a behavioral adaptation. A behavior is uh, what you do. Uh, you know what? D, it's what an organism does to survive, how it behaves. Then there was structural adaptations. Structural adaptations are not what you do. What were structural adaptations? Think about the word structure. <coughs> Sorry? 
Uh, can you say A, B, C, E, F? Sorry? Physical external features. And the key idea with structural Darien is its external features. Behavior is what they do. Then there was a third type. That was also physical, but internally, often chemically. That was physiological. That would be things like uh, cactuses, which are plants needing way less water than normal plants. That's an internal physiological adaptation. Uh, biotic, that's something living. Uh, you know what? Decomposers are an example of biotic features of an ecosystem. Worms, slugs, things that all the dead matter that dies on the ground, leaves and animals, they eventually decompose. If they didn't, we'd be covered in mess. Abiotic, well, an example would be soil conditions, a non-living feature of an ecosystem. Then I had symbiosis and commensalism, and I went, okay. Well, I know commensalism is C. That's where one species benefits and the other is neither helped nor harmed. Remember, as an example, we said the barnacles that travel on large whales, they get a free ride, they're helped. Well, pff, couldn't care less. Not helped, not harmed. Then I have symbiosis. By the way, Symbiosis is going to be uh, B, the interaction between two members of two different species that live in the, together in the same ecosystem. What's G? What would the word be for the interaction between species where one species benefits and the other species is harmed? That's parasite. Okay. Uh, most of you, in fact, all of you have parasites. Did you know that? No, I don't have a good. Um, in terms of the quiz, I'm only going to count the multiple choice and matching. So you're going to give yourself a score out of 16 because I thought some of these other questions were kind of uh, really open-ended. We're going to talk about them still. So turn the page. Give two similarities and one difference between hot deserts and cold deserts. This is from page in your textbook. In fact, it's even open to the same page right now, just about. I was looking these up when I did my answer key. If you want to, you can turn to page 26. No, yeah, 27. Talking about hot and cold desert. What did you say? What are some, similar what are some similarities? OK, little rainfall. Fancy word for rainfall begins with the letter P. Okay, little precipitation, they both have that the same. Little precip, comma. What else do they have the same in common? Few plants. Few plants. What else? Yeah, uh, you know what? I should be careful, Kenzie. I'll, I'll take that. It's really few plant species because there may be lots of plants in an area all the same type because maybe those ones have adapted to this unique niche in that ecosystem. Sorry? Cold-ish at night, sure. Uh, the other one that I said that it said in the textbook was uh, the soil is often salty. That's why you have so many salt lakes or dried salt beds out in desert areas because there's no rainwater. Any salt that shows up there, it's going to stay there. It's not going to get washed away. Uh, what are some differences? So uh, days are warmer in hot deserts. That's why they're called hot deserts and cold deserts. By the way, cold is a relative term. A cold desert can still be very hot, but a hot desert is, holy smokes, wow, I've never seen this in my life, hot. What else? Sorry? No, but you, you feel it. Uh, experienced. Thank you. Fine. Uh, other stuff that I wrote. Uh, Reptiles are more common in hot deserts. Small mammals are more common in cold deserts. Oh, and they occur at different latitudes. Most of the hot deserts are around the equator. Most of the cold deserts are in the northern or southern hemispheres. Mostly in the northern hemispheres. 
Number 18, explain the importance of adaptations to the survival of plants and animals in their biome. Well, the whole idea behind adapting is you want a species to be able to do two things. Number one, survive, and number two, reproduce. So if you don't adapt to an ecosystem, you're either going to starve or you may actually find enough food to survive, but the conditions may be such that what you need, yeah, give me a little help. Thank you. You know what? We need to give him some real assistance. I trust you, Jesse. There you go. Um, you may be able to survive for one generation, but you may need some type of nesting situation to reproduce that doesn't exist. So what I wrote is uh, adaptation is essential for survive, survive, surviving and repro producing. Otherwise, extinction. Uh, we've done that with several species on our own. We have damaged their habitat that they need, their niche, and suddenly there's not enough land or food or unique nesting situation or breeding situation, and they die off. This one, yeah, number 18, I thought was kind of wishy-washy. That was one I decided I wasn't going to count the written section. Uh, number 19, explain why ecosystems with similar characteristics can exist in different geographical locations. You've noticed on that map of all the biomes that they don't all just exist in one, the same area. They're spread out over the planet, many of them. Why? Not good, okay. uh, nope. Good thought, though. How, how can you get uh, a snowy, cold area near the equator? Because you can. How? Yeah. Can you the high elevation? Yeah, OK, so certainly elevations play a part. I'd say elevations can change climate in one area. And as soon as you change the climate, you're going to get a different ecosystem. You're going to get a different biome. Now. If there's one high mountain in the middle of a tropical area, we don't put a whole separate biome on the map just for that one mountain. So as an example, Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa used to have snow on the top. It doesn't anymore because of climate change, believe it or not. But it used to have snow on the top. Well, we don't put a little tundra biome in the middle of Africa. That's just too detailed. We're not that detailed. But it had its own little microclimate. What else? What were the big two things that affected biomes and the types precipitation okay now what affects precipitation things like ocean currents right which change depending on where you are so i would say ocean currents cha chain change type mr duick change precip which changes biomes climate sure Anything else? What else did I write here? Bless you. Even, even mountains that aren't high enough, Hayden, to have uh, snow on the top, those mountains deflect the wind, change the wind patterns. We talked about there being a rain shadow often behind a mountain, a drier area, because when the wind hits the mountain, it gets deflected higher, and the higher it gets, the less water it can hold. That's why there's rain on the windward side of a mountain. But on the leeward side, the non-wind side, there's often a dry area, a rain shadow. So there's all these things playing a part. So what I would like you to do then is give yourself a score out of 16. But I want you to hang on to these to study from. So I'm not going to collect them. I was going to count the scores, but enough of you didn't do it that all I would do is punish you. And while I'm tempted to, if you didn't do it, you got away with it. But hopefully you learned something going through with it. Can you please get this out? It was called Section 1.2 Ecosystems Homework. <laughs>